Alam yang mengapa kalau di ni boh, no, alat suri di sekuensi mode, nausung week week three mah boh, no, di ni mana ya, atau di search di search algo ni betul ni ni alat boh, no, dia ambil es follow sahaja di language, dah ada machine translation mah boh, no, tu account zon sentence ko live video, tu nanti ni ada zon sentence ko live share ni, mah tunggu hari tu, tunggu hari macam tak cukup, no, di masa ni ada betul ni ada analisis ni belum load lagi boh, no, es search ko tu, es search ko tu ni dah cukup abis. Esok kita dah mula belajar, aku tu ayah anak itu macam tu, sedih hal pelu jumlah soalnya, betul ni, ni pelajar itu semua macam ni, betul tak dia orang lo, kalau show ni dia tidak mula nak tangan lagi pada, anak itu orang nak melayu, aku orang le, dia cuma memilih orang lagi, betul, dia orang itu aku nama melayu, so aku dia orang ini ni dia dia orang melayu, betul, so dia orang ini nama melayu, aku nama melayu, pelajar lah, betul. In the third course of this sequence of five courses, you saw how error analysis can help you focus your time on doing the most useful work for your project. Now, Beam Search is an approximate search algorithm, also called a heuristic search algorithm, and so it doesn't always output the most likely sentence. Um, it's only keeping track of B equals 3 or 10 or 100 top possibilities. So what if Beam Search makes a mistake? In this video, you learn how error analysis interacts with Beam Search and how you can figure out whether it is the Beam Search algorithm that's causing problems and worth spending time on, or whether it might be your RNN model that is causing problems and worth spending time on. Let's take a look at how to do error analysis with Beam Search. Let's use this example of uh, Jane Vizy, the freak on Subtalk. So let's say that um, in your Machine translation dev set, your development set, the human provided this translation and came visit Africa in September. And I'm going to call this Y star. So this is a pretty good translation written by a human. But let's say that when you run a beam search on your uh, learned RNN model, on your learned translation model, it ends up with this translation, which we call Y hat. Jane visited Africa last September, which is a much worse translation of the French sentence. It actually changes the meaning, so it's not a good translation. Now, your model has two main components. There is a neural network model, the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, um, you know, which I'm going to call, that's your RNN model. It's really an encoder and a decoder. And you have your beam search algorithm, which you're running with some B with B. And one of the nice if you could attribute this error, this not very good translation, to one of these two components. Was it the RNN, or really the neural network that is more to blame, or is it the beam search algorithm that is more to blame? And what you saw in uh, the third course of the sequence is that it's always tempting to collect more training data that never hurts. So in a similar way, it's always tempting to increase the beam work. You know, that never hurts, but pretty much never hurts. But just as getting more training data by itself might not to get you to the level of performance you want, um, in the same way, increasing the beam work by itself might not get you to where you want to go. And so but how do you decide whether or not um, improving the search algorithm is a good use of your time? So here's how you can break the problem down and figure out what's actually a good use of your time. Now, the RNN, the neural network, which is called RNN, really means the encoder and the decoder, it computes P of Y given X. So, for example, for a sentence, Jane visits Africa in September, you plug in Jane visits Africa. Again, I'm ignoring uh, upper versus lower case for now, right? and so on, and this computes P of Y given X. So it turns out that the most useful thing for you to do at this point is to compute using this model to compute P of Y star given X as well as to compute P of Y hat given X using your RNA model and then to see which of these two is bigger. So it's possible that the left side is bigger than the right hand side. It's also possible that uh, P of Y star is less than P of Y hat actually less than or equal to. And depending on which of these two cases hold true, you'd be able to more clearly ascribe this particular error, this particular bad translation, to one of the RNN or the beam search algorithm being at greater fault. So let's figure out the logic behind this. Here are the two sentences from the previous slide. And remember, we're going to compute 
P of Y star given X and P of Y hat given X and see which of these two and see which of these two is bigger. So there are going to be two cases. In case one, P of Y star given X as output by the um, RNN model is greater than P of Y hat given X. What does this mean? Well, the beam search algorithm chose Y hat. Right. The way you got Y hat was you had an RNN that was computing P of Y given X, and Beamsur's job was to try to find the value of Y that gives that of X. But in this case, Y star actually attains a higher value for P of Y given X than did Y hat. So what this allows you to conclude is beam search is failing to actually give you the value of Y that maximizes P of Y given X. Because um, you know, the one job that beam search had was to find the value of Y that makes this really big, but it chose Y hat, but Y star actually gets a much bigger value. So in this case, you could conclude that beam search is at fault. Now, how about the other case? In case two, P of Y star given X is less than or equal to P of Y hat given X. Right? And then, you know, either this or this has got to be true. So either case one or case two has to hold true. What you conclude under case two? Well, in our example, Y star is a better translation than Y hat. But according to the RNN, P of Y star is less than P of Y hat. So saying that Y star is a less likely output than Y hat. So in this case, it seems that the RNN model is at fault, and it might be worth spending more time working on the RNN. Um, there's some subtleties here pertaining to length normalization that I'm glossing over. Uh, if the, there's some subtleties pertaining to length normalization that I'm glossing over. Uh, and if you are using some sort of length normalization, instead of evaluating these probabilities, you should be evaluating the optimization objective that takes into account length normalization. But ignoring that complication for now, in this case, what this tells you is that um, even though Y star is a better translation, the RNN ascribed Y star a lower probability than the inferior translation. So in this case, I would say the RNN model is at fault. So the error analysis process looks as follows. You go through the development set and find the mistakes that the algorithm made in the development set. Um, and so in this example, let's say that uh, P of Y star given X was 2 by 10 to the minus 10, whereas P of Y hat given X was 1 by 10 to the minus 10. Using the logic from the previous slide, in this case, we see that beam search actually chose Y hat, which has a lower probability than Y star. So I would say beam search is at fault. So I abbreviate that B. And then you go through a second mistake, a second bad output by the algorithm. Uh, look at these probabilities, and maybe for the second example, you think the model is at fault. I abbreviate the RNN model uh, with R. And you go through more examples, and sometimes the beam search is at fault, sometimes the model is at fault, and so on. And through this process, you can then carry out error analysis to figure out what fraction of errors are due to beam search versus the RNN model. And with an error analysis process like this, for every example in your dev set where the algorithm gives a much worse example, where the algorithm gives a much worse output than the human translation, you can try to ascribe the error to either the search algorithm or to the objective function or to the RNN model that generates the objective function that beam search is supposed to be maximizing. And through this, you can try to figure out which of these two components is responsible for more errors. And only if you find that beam search is responsible for a lot of errors, then maybe it's worth working hard to increase the beam width. Whereas in contrast, if you find that the RNN model is at fault, then you could do a deeper layer of analysis to try to figure out if you want to add regularization or get more training data or try a different network architecture or something else. And so a lot of the techniques that you saw in the third course 
in the third course of the sequence would be applicable there. So that's it for error analysis using beam search. I found this particular error analysis process very useful whenever you have an approximate optimization algorithm, uh, such as beam search, that is working to optimize some sort of objective, some sort of cost function that is output by a learning algorithm, such as a sequence to sequence model, sequence to sequence RNA, that we'll be discussing in these lectures. So with that, I hope that uh, you'll be more efficient at making these types of models work well for your applications. In the the Costco, the Costco zero LS, the cost reality, let's remember me that the structuring machine uh, structuring machine learning project my body mass and the LS with a high speed and a high bias code that I had time we have a location common adapter to be one that's a form of your training that I said to the other I'm going to let us see about the depth and the developments and the matter I teach you a holiday the correctly mommy jala material and you เบบ้างอะไรเช่นพอเป็นกาวมาดิดาเนี่ยกอลเล็ตเช่นกาวมาดิดาเนี่ยกอลเล็ตเช่นกาวมาดิดาเนี่ยกอลเล็ตเช่
part by part through the sentence because it's just really difficult to memorize the whole long sentence like that. And so what you see for the um, encoder-decoder architecture above is that it works quite well for short sentences, so you can achieve relatively high blue score, but for very long sentences, maybe longer than 30 or 40 words, yeah, the performance comes down. So the, the blue score might look like this, that's the sentence and theories. And uh, short sentences are just hard to translate, hard to get all the words right. And uh, uh, long sentences, it doesn't do well on because it's just difficult to get a neural network to memorize a super long sentence. So in this and the next video, you see the attention model, which translates maybe a bit more like humans might, looking at part of a sentence at a time. And with an attention model, machine translation systems performance can look like this, because um, by working one part of a sentence at a time, you don't see this huge dip, which is really measuring the ability of a neural network to memorize a long sentence, which maybe isn't what um, we most badly need a neural network to do. So in this video, I want to just give you the, some intuition about how attention works, and then we'll flesh out the details in the next video. The attention model was due to um, Zimitri, Badenu, Chen Kun Cho, and Yoshe Benjo. And even though it was obviously developed for machine translation, it spread to many other application areas as well. And, and this is really a very influential, um, a very seminal paper in the deep learning literature. So let's illustrate this with a short sentence, uh, even though these ideas were maybe developed more for long sentences, but it'll be easier to illustrate these ideas with a simple example. We have our usual sentence, uh, Jane visit my frequent sometime. And let's say that we use a uh, RNN, and in this case, I'm going to use a bidirectional RNN in order to compute um, some set of features for each of the input words. And here I've drawn the standard bidirectional RNN with uh, outputs y1, y2, y3, and so on, up to y5, but um, we're not doing a word-for-word -word translation, so let me get rid of the y's on top. But using a bidirectional RNN, what we've done is for each of the words, or really for each of the five positions in the sentence, you can compute a very rich set of features about the words in the sentence and maybe surrounding words in every position. Now, let's go ahead and generate the English translation. We're going to use another RNN to generate the English translation. So, um, you know, here's my RNN node as usual. And instead of using A to denote the activation, in order to avoid confusion with the activations down here, I'm just going to use a different notation. I'm going to use S to denote the um, hidden state in this RNN up here. And so instead of writing a1, I'm going to write S1. And so we hope in this model that the first word it generates will be Jane, right, to generate Jane visits Africa in September. Now, the question is, when you're trying to generate this first word, this output, what part of the input French sentence should you be looking at? It seems like you should be looking primarily at this first word, maybe at a few other words close by, but you don't need to be looking way at the end of the sentence. So what the attention model would be computing is a set of attention weights, and we're going to use um, alpha 1, 1 to denote when you're generating the first word, how much should you be paying attention to this first piece of information here. And then we'll also come up with a second Let's call it attention weight, alpha 1, 2, which tells us when we're trying to compute the first word, hopefully Jane, um, how much attention, how much attention should we pay to this second word from the input, and so on, and alpha 1, 3, and so on. And together, this will tell us what is exactly the context, which we'll denote as C, that we should be paying attention to. Um, and that is input to this RNN unit to then try to generate the first word. So that's one step of the RNN. And we'll flesh out a lot of these details in the next video. 
for the second step of this RNN, we're going to um, have a new hidden state S2, and we're going to have a new set of attention weights. So we're going to have alpha 2, 1 to tell us what we're generating the second word. I guess uh, this would be physics, maybe not in the boundary label. How much should we pay attention to the first word in the French input? Um, and also alpha 2, 2, and so on. How much should we pay attention to the word physics? How much should we pay attention to the fleet? And so on. And of course, the first word we generated, J, is also an input to this. And we have some context uh, that we're paying attention to in the second step. There's also an input. And that together will generate the second word. And that leads us to the third step, S3. And this is an input. And we have some new context C that depends on you know, the various uh, alpha, three, the different time steps that tells us how much we be paying attention to the different words from the input French sentence and so on. So some things I haven't specified yet but that we'll go further into detail in the next video is how exactly this context defined and the goal of the context is for the third word is really should capture that maybe you should be looking about this part of the sentence. And, um, and uh, in the, the formula you use to do that will defer to the next video, as well as how do you compute these attention weights. And you see in the next video that um, alpha 3t, which is when you try to generate the third word, as this would be Africa, let's get the right output, um, the amounts that this RNN step should be paying attention to the French word at time t that depends on the activations of the bidirectional RNN at time t. Um, so this will depend on the forward activations and the backward activations at time t. And it will depend on the state from the previous step. So it depends on S2. And these things together will influence how much you pay attention to a specific word at the end of the French sentence. Uh, but we'll flesh out all these details in the next video. But the key intuition to take away is that this way, the RNN marches forward, generating one word at a time until eventually it generates the EOS. And um, at every step, there are these attention weights, alpha T, T prime, that tells it when you're trying to generate the T English word, how much should you be paying attention to the T prime French word. And this allows it on every time step to look only maybe within a local window of the French sentence to pay attention to when generating a specific English word. So I hope this video conveys some intuition about the attention model and that we now have a rough sense of maybe how the algorithm works. Let's go on to the next video to flesh out the details of the attention model. Let's say ten it to yeah the attention more yeah let's see yeah ma let's skip ground with you while I'm a media let's skip ground with you don't know this in a lot of how you is a long brillo is a dandy to be not a forward or three word or a new load your heart in your remote the next to a near by what I'm going to do and I don't say no one has it I'm here I'm going to do it I'm not a quarter do you do this right up on the line in a quarter wise at the poly what the script grammar de mal and then some la idea or don't have it and with a bind direction or don't don't know it's my memory door the mouse and do a bind direction uh are now don't pass all it now for a team is a good attention so it's a good one to a dig up your wallet or not this is a good one james who pretty little like that and basically some of my shit they have attention baby or pretty look on me yeah i don't know attention base yara luma around my whole hold the whole this is only an insert so now my she had a little attention base and I'm going to get my attention paid as a boat was our pay to the ball for five people these are going to the trend of the high time these are going to know up over a minute to the one that now got the cologne that's on a the body out with don't have you know they had the mass on the detail to look all about it as far as name the alpha belly will shout out when I'm blue shot as a big to be you want your piano and then I'll come show me what did you do that Regardless of the data, my demands were more the Kuna Gales or the Angle Daddy Go Da more and then it is from Chinese with the Bolly Wona. The Angle Daddy Go Da Sara, the language trans model, and the machine translation model, Angle Daddy Go Da more than Don Haro Miare, and my elder new demo hope on that. I met with an Avada Lazo to a 
ti lawon san dan se wo lo wa yo tsan lo ha tan ti bi ha ma san bi us cost wa ti ya la pyo tsan na a ti le so ma ti dai ko no kuna ti ya pa ko no me sha men ta ku lo lo le ni lai de di tin ma to ba ra ma shin bi ya to a u ta me di ha ra pa ko no me sha men ne ya di ta ku la ko ni si lan bi tsan ti ma lai de bo no a lo so ti ya la so short san dan ma so a lao yi bi tsan na ma shi bo no ne ne ni ne de me Sandan sin daga la ne 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 shi la bi so en tu ye ha pa pa ma tai ma ka on da o so de ba po yao da o no kuna le so an ko da di ko da mo re di a da lo a lo so lo di a lo myo di ga myo di ga myo mo re o ma tong be de bo no di ga myo san san da an ya yi o bu lo myo lo en ka on le so ye pong na myo twa la di ko la de idea di bo no so a di ga human ya bu lo lo de lu ye ya bu lo lo de so ye pong mu di yo to a che ka na ye so de bo di bo pong ma so lu biao ga le myo twa di sandan go ka sa so mu lo wa ma ma rai so da la pya na myo lo ba shi bo no ตัวเลยเนาะดิบายเซตัวว่าส่วนตัวว่าดามองเลยที่ซันดัตตะจองเปียดิจองดามองเลยเนาะว่าต้องนี่ลงเข้าว่าดาเปียนาเนี่ย
fifth time step, um, a fifth time step. Um, you know, have a zero here. Uh, technically, you could also have a, um, I guess a backwards. Well, six as a factor of all zeros, especially as a factor of all zeros. And then to simplify the notation going forward, um, at every time step, even though you have the features computed from the forward recurrence and from the backward recurrence in a bidimensional RNA, I'm just going to use A of T to represent both of these um, concatenated together. So AT is going to be our feature vector for um, time step T. Although to be consistent with notation we'll use in a second, I'm going to call this T prime. I'm actually going to use T prime to index into the words in the uh, French sentence. Next, we have our forward only, so it's a single direction RNN with state S to generate the translation. And so at the first time step, it should generate Y1. And this will have as input some context C. And if you want to index it with time, I guess you could write uh, C1, but sometimes I just write C without the superscript 1. And this will depend on the attention parameters. So alpha 1, 1, um, alpha 1, 2, and so on tells us how much attention. And so these um, alpha parameters tells us how much the context will depend on the features we're getting, or the activations we're getting from the different time steps. And so the way we'll define the context is it'll actually be a weighted sum of the features from the different time steps weighted by these attention weights. So more formally, uh, the attention weights will satisfy this, that they'll all be non-negative, so it'll be a zero positive, and they'll sum to one. We'll see later how to make sure this is true. And we will have that the context or the context at time one, I'll often drop that superscript. That's going to be sum over t prime, all the values of t prime of this weighted sum of these um, attention uh, of these activations. So this term here are the attention weights, and this term here uh, is comes from here. And so alpha t t prime is the amount of attention that y t should pay to a of t prime. So in other words, when you're generating the T output word, how much should you be paying attention to the T prime input word? So that's one step of generating the output, and then at the next time step, um, you generate the second output, and it's again done similarly, where now you have a new set of attention weights, um, they define a new way to sum, that generates a new context, this is also input, and that allows you to generate the second word. Only now, as this way to sum becomes the context of the second time step is sum over t prime alpha two t prime. So using these um, context vectors, C1, which is right there back in, C2, and so on, this network up here looks like a pretty standard RNN sequence with uh, the context vectors as output, and we can just generate the translation one word at a time. We have also defined how to compute the context vectors in terms of these attention weights and those features of the input sentence. So the only remaining thing to do is to define how to actually compute these attention weights. Let's do that on the next slide. So just to recap, alpha t t prime is the amount of attention you should pay to a t prime when you're trying to generate the t words in the 
output in translation. So let me just write down the formula as we talk about how this works. Uh, this is a formula you can use to compute alpha t t prime. So we're going to compute these terms e t t prime, and then use essentially a softmax to make sure that these weights sum to one if you sum over t prime. So for every fixed value of t, these things sum to one if you're summing over t prime. And using this uh, softmax parameterization uh, just ensures this property is sum to one. Now, how do you compute these factors e? Well, one way to do so is to use a small neural network as follows. So, s t minus one was the neural network state from the previous time step. So here's the network we have. Um, if you're trying to generate y t, then s t minus one was the hidden state from the previous step that's fed into s t, and uh, that's one input to the, to a very small neural network, usually in one hidden layer neural network, because you need to compute these a lot. And then uh, a t prime, the feature is from time step t prime is the other input. And the intuition is, if you want to decide how much attention uh, to pay to the activation of t prime, well, the things that seems like it should depend the most on is what is your own hidden state activation from the previous time step. Um, you don't have the current state activation yet because the context feeds into this, so you haven't computed that. But look at whatever hidden stages of this other than generating the output translation. And then for each of the positions, each of the words, look at their features. So it seems pretty natural that alpha t t prime and e t t prime should depend on these two quantities. But we don't know what the function is, so what they could do is just train a very small neural network to learn whatever this function should be and trust that application, trust gradient descent um, to learn the right function. And it turns out that if you implement this whole model and train it with gradient descent, the whole thing actually works. This little neural network does a pretty decent job telling you um, how much attention yt should pay to a t prime and this formula makes sure that the attention weighs sum to one and then as you chug along generating one word at a time this neural network actually pays attention to the right parts of the input sentence and that's all this automatically using gradient descent now one downside of this algorithm is that it does take quadratic time, or quadratic cost to run this algorithm. If you have tx words in the input and ty words in the output, then the total number of these attention parameters is going to be tx times ty. Um, and so this algorithm runs in quadratic cost. Although in machine translation applications where uh, neither input nor output sentence is usually that long, maybe quadratic cost is actually acceptable. Although there's some research work on trying to reduce this cost as well. Now, so far I've been describing the attention idea uh, in the context of machine translation. Without going too much into detail, this idea has been applied to other problems as well, such as image captioning. So in the image captioning problem, the task is to look at a picture and write a caption for that picture. So in this paper, set to the bottom by Kevin Xu, Jimmy Barr, Ryan Kiros, Cameron Shaw, Eric Corver, Russell Sankutinov, Rich Zemel, and Yoshi Benjo, uh, the author showed that you could have a very similar architecture, look at a picture, and um, pay attention only to parts of the picture at a time while you're writing a caption for a picture. Um, so if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look at that paper as well. And you get to play with all this more in the uh, program exercise. Whereas machine translation is a very complicated problem, in the program exercise, you get to implement and play with the attention value yourself for the date normalization problem. So the problem of inputting a date like this, this is actually the date of the uh, Apollo moon landing and normalizing it into standard formats for a date like this and having a neural network, a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, normalize it to this format. 
and this, by the way, is the uh, birth date of William Shakespeare, also is believed to be. And uh, what you see in the current exercise is you can train a neural network to input dates in you know any of these formats and have it use an attention model to generate a normalized format for these dates. One other thing that's sometimes fun to do is to look at the visualizations of the attention points. So here's a uh, machine translation example. And here we're plotted in different colors, the magnitude of the different attention weights. Um, I don't spend too much time on this, but you find that the corresponding input and output words, you find that the uh, attention weights will tend to be high, thus suggesting that when it's generating a specific word in output, is you know, usually paying attention to the correct word in the input. And all this, including learning where to pay attention when, was all learned using back propagation of an attention model. So that's it for the attention model, really one of the most powerful ideas in deep learning. Um, I hope you enjoy implementing and playing with some of these ideas yourself later in this week's program exercises. Cool. In the last ตอนนี้เราเลยกางซาตัวอะไรบ่เนาะน่ะมันน้ําเลยไล่ป่าวโหลโซอ๋อซาเหมือนกันดิหาเลยอ่ะกูอ่ะดิกะคุณน่ะ
and the human ear does a computation pretty similar to this pre-processing step. So one of the most exciting trends in speech recognition is that once upon a time, speech recognition systems used to be built using phonemes, and these were, uh, I want to say, hand-engineered basic units of sound. So the quick brown flags we represented as phonemes. I'm going to simplify a bit and say the has a the in it, the sound, and quick has a k in it, the k sound. Um, and linguists used to write out these basic units of sound and try to break language down into these basic units of sound. So brown, right? These aren't the official phonemes, which are written with uh, complicated notation, but but linguists used to hypothesize that writing down audio in terms of these basic units of sound called phonemes would be the best way to do speech recognition. But with end-to-end -end deep learning, we're finding that phony representations are no longer necessary. But instead, you can build systems that input an audio clip and directly output a transcript without needing to use uh, hand engineered representations like these. One of the things that made this possible was going to much larger data sets. So, so academic data sets on speech recognition might be as 300 hours and uh, in academia, a 3,000 hour data set of transcribed audio would be considered reasonable size. So a lot of research has been done. A lot of research papers have been written on data sets that are several thousand hours. But the best commercial systems are now trained on over 10,000 hours and sometimes over 100,000 hours of audio. And it's really um, moving to much larger audio data sets, transcribed audio data sets with both X and Y, together with deep learning algorithms that has driven a lot of progress in speech recognition. So how do you build a speech recognition system? In the last video, we'll talk about the attention model. So one thing you could do is actually do that, where on the horizontal axis, you take in different time frames of the audio input, and then you have an attention model, try to output the transcript, like the quick brown fox, or what it was said. One other method that seems to work well is to use the CTC cost for speech recognition. CTC stands for Connectionist Temporal Classification, and is due to Alex Gray, Santiago Fernandez, Faustina Gomez, and Jürgen Schmidhuber. So here's the idea. Let's say the audio clip was of, was of someone saying the quick brown fox. We're going to use a we're going to use a neural network structured like this with an equal number of input x's and output y's. And I've drawn a simple uh, not unidirectional forward only RNN for this, but in practice this will usually be a bidirectional LSTM or bidirectional GRU and usually a deeper model. But notice that the number of time steps here is very large. And in speech recognition, usually the number of input time steps is much bigger than the number of output time steps. So for example, if you have 10 seconds of audio and your features come at 100 hertz, so 100 samples per uh, second, then a 10 second audio clip would end up with a thousand inputs, right? So it's 100 hertz times 10 seconds ends up with a thousand inputs. But your output might not have a thousand alphabets, might not have a thousand characters. So what do you do? The CTC cost function allows the uh, RNN to generate an output like this. TTT, there's a special character called a blank character, which I'm going to write as an underscore here. H, blank, E, 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 blank, blank, blank. Um, and then maybe a space, I'm going to write like this, so that's a space. And then blank, 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 Q, 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 blank, blank. And this is considered a correct output for the first part of the space quick with the Q. And the basic rule for the CTC cost function is to collapse repeated characters not separated by blank. So to be clear, I'm using this underscore to denote the special blank character, and that's different than the space character. So there is a space here between the and quick, so I should output a space. 
But by collapsing repeated characters not separated by blank, it actually collapsed the sequence into T, H, E, and then space, and Q, R. And this allows the neural network to have a thousand outputs by repeating characters a lot of times, so inserting a bunch of blank characters, and still end up with a much shorter output text transcript. So this phrase here, the quick brown fox, including spaces, actually has 19 characters. And uh, if somehow the neural network is forced to output a thousand characters by allowing the network to insert blanks and repeated characters, it can still represent this 19 character output with this 1,000 outputs uh, values of y. So this paper is by Alex Graves, as well as uh, Baidu's Deep Speech Speech Recognition System, which I was involved in, used this idea to build effective speech recognition systems. So I hope that gives you a rough sense of wow. how speech recognition models work. Uh, attention light models work and CTC models work and present two different options on how to go about building these systems. Now, today, building a effective or production scale speech recognition system is a pretty significant effort and requires a very large data set. But what I'd like to do in the next video is share with you how you can build a trigger word detection system or keyword detection system, which is actually much easier and could be done with even a smaller or more reasonable amount of data. So let's talk about that in the next video. One of the most อาซาอาซาเทสโกคัดละไปเถอะนะสปีชเลยอ่ะหรือว่าจะจ่าเลยวะล่ะไปเลยขันตาละยาอาซาเทสโกคัดละเยไปเถอะนะเบ้อแล
you've now learned so much about deep learning and sequence models that you can actually describe a trick word system quite simply uh, just on one slide, as you see in this video. But what allows the speech recognition that there are more and more devices you can wake up with your voice, and those are sometimes called trigger word detection systems. So let's see how you can build a trigger word system. Examples of trigger word systems include the Amazon Echo, which is woken up with the word Alexa, the Baidu Duo OS pod devices woken up with the phrase Xiaodu Ni Hao, uh, Apple Siri woken up with Hey Siri, and Google Home woken up with OK Google. So it's thanks to trigger word detection that if you have, say, an Amazon Echo in your living room, you can walk through your living room and just say, Alexa, what time is it? And have it wake up or be triggered by the word Alexa and answer your voice query. So if you can build a trigger word detection system, maybe you can make your computer do something by telling it, computer activate. One of my friends also works on turning on and off a particular lamp using a trigger word, kind of as a fun project. But what I want to show you is how you can build a trigger word detection system. The literature on trigger word detection algorithm is still evolving, so there isn't wide consensus yet on what's the best algorithm for trigger word detection. So I'm just going to show you one example of an algorithm you could use. Now, you've seen RNNs like this, and what we really do is take an audio clip, uh, maybe compute spectrogram features, and that generates features x1, x2, x3, audio features x1, x2, x3 that you pass through an RNN. And so all that remains to be done is to define the target labels Y. So if this point in the audio clip is when someone just finished saying the trigger word, such as Alexa or Xiaodu Ni Hao or Hey Siri or OK Google, then in the training sets, you can set the target labels to be zero for everything before that point and right after that to set the target label of one. And then if a uh, little bit later on, you know, the trigger word was said again, and the trigger word was said at this point, then you can again set the target label to be one right after that. Now, this type of uh, labeling scheme for an RNN, you know, could work. Actually, this will actually work reasonably well. Um, one slight disadvantage of this is it creates a very imbalanced training set with a lot more zeros than ones. So one other thing you could do that's just getting a little bit of a hack, but um, could make the model a little bit easier to train, is instead of setting only a single time step to output one, you could actually make it output a few ones for several times or for a fixed period of time before reverting back to zero. So at that, um, slightly evens out the uh, ratio of ones to zeros. But this is a little bit of a hack. But if this is when in the audio clip a trigger word is said, then right after that, you can set the target label to one. And if this is the trigger word set again, then right after that is when you want the RNN to um, output one. So you get to play more of this as well in the programming exercise, but uh, I think you should feel quite proud of yourself if you've learned enough about deep learning that it just takes one picture and one slide to, dis to describe something as complicated as trigger word detection. And based on this, I hope you'll be able to implement something that works and allows you to detect trigger words. But you'll see more of this in the programming exercise. So that's it for trigger words, and I hope you feel quite proud of yourself for how much you've learned about deep learning, that you can now describe trigger words in just one slide in a few minutes, and that you can hopefully implement it and get it to work, maybe even make it do something fun in your house, like you might turn on or turn off, or you can do something on your computer when you or when someone else says a trigger word. Um, this is the last technical video of this course, and to wrap up, in this course on sequence models, you learned about RNNs, including both uh, GRUs and LSTMs, and then in the second week, you learned a lot about word embeddings and how to learn representations of words, and then in this week, uh, you learned about the attention model as well as how to use it to process audio data. 
and I hope you have fun implementing all of these ideas in this week's drawing exercise. Let's go on to the last video. โอเคบ่าดูเดมาเลยเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเลเ
ဒီဒီနာပြောတဲ့အမလောတော့ဟိုတနာပဲဟောသူကမြာကြီးကြောတာပြီဆိုတော့လက်စကြောတဲ့အမလောတော့ဟောနောက်ကုတ်ကို
ตัวอ่ะมันก็ดูจะหนาวกว่าอ๋อเลยเนี่ยอะตัวนี้เราเลยสรุปขึ้นมาบ่ก็ก็มีอย่างนี้อ่างานน้ําเลยไอ้หาย